right, well, welcome everyone to yet another edition of Taking Stock Live, where we do just that. We take stock, stock with leaders, thought leaders, people who are inspiring me and my team all around the globe with the work that they're driving, the teams that they're leading, and of course, the brands that they represent. Today is going to be super fun because who doesn't love candy, chocolate, and pets? We have Deepak Jose, who's been an incredible partner to Microsoft. I know he won't say it about himself. What I will say is last year in 2022, he topped uh, the list in terms of 100 innovators in data and analytics. And Deepak, just a huge welcome to you today. Shelly, this is fantastic. Thank you for uh, giving this opportunity to talk about our Mars and Microsoft partnership. And I always start my conversation by this. If I were in person, I would have definitely started by giving you some m and or Snickers. Well, you already did. Um, and I'm sitting here uh, at my desk, as I mentioned to you before we went live, hoarding uh, your the gift that just arrived for me on Friday, which has M and M, which has M on one side for Mars and Microsoft logo on the other side. So um, thank you for that. Absolutely, my pleasure, Shelley. Really grateful for it, and an incredible conversation with your team. So, you know, just to start off, we always um, on this one start start now. So many people around the globe got their first job in retail or in CPG, and I actually don't know if your first job was in retail, but maybe tell take us way back. Uh, tell us what your first job was, Deepak, and maybe some of the lessons, the life lessons that um, that it inspired in you even then. Absolutely. I am a mechanical engineer by trade, and my first job was with a power and automation company called EBB, Asia Brown Bovary. I started my career in India. Uh, so the top three lessons that I would share, the, the first thing uh, is about building your network and long-term relationships. I think this is something that I learned from EBB, the importance of uh, building that network to begin with. If you surround yourself with a group of smart and diverse set of with diverse set of ideas, I think you are going to eventually become smarter. This is something my mentor told me uh, decades back, and that still rings true uh, to me. I've learned a lot uh, with my colleagues then, and they help me uh, upskill myself. They help me make the right kind of connection, and uh, and that is something I cherish now also. The second aspect uh, is on building a learning mindset. Now, working, uh, starting my career with the technology-led organization, uh, one thing that I have realized in the beginning was the technology of today might not be relevant for tomorrow. I think we need to continuously reinvent ourselves. I think that is very important. And how? And the only way to reinvent yourself is through having a learning journey mindset uh, throughout your career. And the last aspect, I mean, growing up in India, uh, working for ABB, one of the uh, great inspiration for me uh, uh, was Mother Teresa. Mm -hmm. um, one of her leadership, uh, my leadership principles are always influenced by her. And one of the, uh, the quotes that she told, not everybody can do great things, but all of us can do small things with great love. And this is something which resonates with me a lot. So I try to find that small thing in all my jobs, which I am really passionate about. And I want to hit the ball out of the park when, when it comes to that small thing. Uh, that I mean, these are the three lessons. Now, if I were to sum up uh, one more additional bonus thing on relationship and networking, I met my wife at APB. So I'm grateful for that, for, for, for my first job. Wow. <laughs> well, that's no small thing. Uh, with great love, I would imagine. Uh, wow. Congratulations. And uh, that's probably the most important uh, career opportunity I've ever heard on this podcast is um, meeting meeting your life partner, but also, um, you know, what you shared in terms of your network and those long term relationships, uh, in addition to a, a learning mindset. Really fantastic. Thank you. So now, uh, now fast forward uh, to the present day, where you have a, a large remit and a large team, where you're the global director of demand analytics at Mars. Even the name itself, um, tell us a little bit about what that role is, how it involves, and what it means. 
Yeah, so let me start with uh, one demand data analytics. So I, I generally get this question, do you do demand planning? Is that, what, what does that demand stand for? The idea of one demand came from the Mars Snacking leadership team, uh, Andrew Clark, Gulen, uh, et cetera. When the idea of data and analytics in traditional CPG organization used to be, hey, there is a sales analytics team, there is a brand analytics team, there is a media analytics team, and people were doing data and analytics and the business decisions in silo. So how can we break the silo and how can we have a one demand mindset instead of a functional mindset? So that is how the, the theme of one demand uh, came together. We uh, call our, ourselves ODDA or like ODA team, which is one demand data and analytics. And our purpose is to supercharge 100 percentage of decision making within the organization, leveraging advanced analytics. Now, uh, as part of my remit, I have the opportunity to work with a fantastic solution team, uh, starting from the business translator who understands the business problem and uh, decode it in a way a data scientist would be able to understand. A data scientist would subsequently work with uh, the data engineers to get the right kind of data uh, to solve this problem. So think about end-to-end -end solutions uh, that we are building with the key one thing mind, how can we maximize the value for Mars as an organization, not only for our company, but for our consumers, customers, and associates. I would imagine the different business silos or the business units that you serve were thrilled to see sort of you unify under one demand data and analytics. I have to admit, even for me, when I read it, I keep I kept having to say, is it on demand? But now that I've heard you sort of explain how you unify, um, that must have been a almost a groundbreaking kind of principle and organizational model within within the company. Absolutely, absolutely. And it always started from the top with the leadership sponsorship, right? Uh, see, I think uh, uh, you would have heard the story of four blind men explaining an elephant, somebody touching the trunk, calling it something, somebody touching the leg, somebody touching the... See, I think in a large organization, different functions operate in a large silo. And sometimes we lose the big picture. Now, what one demand data and analytics team is trying to do is to build that single source of truth so that um, the elephant in the room, in our case, is our consumer. So how can we give the integrated brand experience? How can we take them through an integrated consumer journey? So that is the objective uh, that we are trying to accomplish. And this will be powered by data and analytics. So that's the role. It's a fantastic role. Uh, it is it is right where we can drive a lot of value for the organization, uh, along with our partners. Uh, and we partner quite a lot with the Microsoft team in uh, uh, enabling that and supercharging this. It's such a forward-looking perspective. We talk a lot about how likely, in some future scenario, the data that you and your team are shepherding on behalf of the organization and optimizing on behalf of the organization could be an asset on your balance sheet, just like you know your factories and many of the other things. It's such a valuable asset, but not as many leaders really think about it as explicitly as the way you've organized for it. Building that snack, snacking data platform is going to be very important for us. And we believe that that is going to give us that uh, unique and competitive advantage. In addition to the work that Mars and Microsoft do together, we are both purpose-led organizations. And for Mars, that cuts across many of the brands that our audience will know, whether it's M&Ms or Wrigley's or Twix Bar, but also a very large veterinarian and pet care business. So talk a little bit about how the purpose-led part of Mars also influences your organization. Shelly, I'm lucky to be part of uh, Mars, which is a purpose-driven organization. At Mars, we fellow Martians, we tell the world we want tomorrow starts with how we do business today. Uh, Mars as an organization, we are led or guided by our five principles. Uh, many organizations, it, it is, this is, these are something which you simply put on a wall, but I think at Mars, the associates uh, leverage to take day-to-day decision-making. Now, one of the five principles that I want to highlight today is on mutuality. Now, we believe that if you want to win together as a team, you should not only think about winning for Mars, we need to think about how can we build solutions and capabilities where 
your consumers are winning your customers are winning and your associates are winning so how can we build the capabilities beyond uh, uh, you as a company but for people planet and then eventually driving profit for the organization so that is essential part of we are as a company and how we drive the solutions now one of the important aspect that i want to highlight uh, which is a cornerstone of how we build ai solutions in the team which we do quite a bit uh, is the responsible ai aspect of it now uh, mars as an organization we are really proud that we have a very solid responsible marketing guideline and our responsible ai is supporting the responsible marketing guideline as well now the responsible ai principle that we have we think about how can we build capabilities which are transparent how can we avoid the biases which might be inherent from historical data how can we build the right kind of uh, diversity and inclusion when we are thinking about building ai driven models so these are essentially part of uh, how we build the solution so uh, i'm very thrilled about that purpose it is relatively easier for a purpose driven brand to attract the talent as well so that that helps us uh, from a day to day basis how we operate as a data analytics team it's so important and i think um you know obviously for both of our companies there's sort of no finish line in responsible but ai but it's so grounding and exciting to hear that you know you and your team you know sort of social responsibility is not just something that's sitting in a separate esg group but it's actually core to your data and analytics team absolutely and i think our the associates who come and join mars one of the main reason that they join mars is because of our purpose the responsible ai principles that we have so uh, it helps us to attract the talent uh, engage with them and retain them on an ongoing basis that's terrific so as you think about um you know this is certainly uh, I, th- I think someone said to me you know coming out of covid would in some ways be more complicated for mm-hmm. C- for brands and retailers and even going in which at the time seemed impossible to fathom but it really has been even a, a busy 2023 already what gets you excited about the year ahead and sort of what are the bigger some of the bigger opportunities that you and the team are driving so i think let me talk a little bit about how we have evolved as a team over the last uh, 3 years since pandemic and i i want to start by telling you a story you might have heard it uh, some of your listeners would have heard it as well um, this is a story about a uh, 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 honduran bridge um, so have you heard about the story of this? i haven't heard it no <laughs> so let me let me uh, uh entertain you with this so this uh, the central american country honduras it is prone to a lot of earthquake natural disasters flooding etc so in the 1940s the us government collaborated with the honduran government to build a bridge uh, which can last hurricanes right like it was built to last uh, i mean the bridge is called the choloteca bridge so do you know what happened the bridge was built it was a tourist attraction but several decades later another hurricane hit the country hurricane mitch now there was a lot of rainfall flooding do you know what happened the river changed its course now you have a bridge which was built to last but in this case there was no water under the bridge simply the river changed its course now when we think about pandemic Uh, i mean this was a natural disaster a disaster that hit the humanity and that that was uh, that happened to a lot of the technology companies uh, uh, companies like mars and our technology infrastructure as well now at mars we had built the technology not to we, we don't we have a, a theme of building to adapt rather than rather than building to last so the adaptability in the capability that we built helped us quite a bit and uh, what what does that mean as we came out of the when we were going through the pandemic we saw our consumer preferences changing our e-commerce business started accelerating there are new kinds of customers that we started developing like uh, on demand delivery aggregators like instacart deliveroo delivery hero so with the market changes we were able to build a data and analytics and uh, infrastructure which was built for adapting 
and and thanks to your team so we had the right of right kind of infrastructure for it now in 2022 we had one of the best years for uh, mars wrigley in general so uh, we are really happy about it and that creates a lot of opportunity for us in 2023 now, uh, we, I personally am quite excited. A uh, few weeks back, end of Jan, we had our uh, leadership conference for Mars Snacking uh, in Newark. Uh, we had the top 100 leaders in the demand, uh, and this event was sponsored by our uh, president, uh, uh, Andrew Clark, and uh, led by Gulen, our chief growth officer. And we are building out the next horizon strategy for Mars snacking, which gives me a lot of energy. And uh, I personally am excited because a lot of the strategy, uh, the critical element of the strategy is powered by data and analytics. So uh, that is uh, making it quite exciting. My personal favorite is I think uh, we are going beyond talking about tools. Uh, we are talking about how can we truly change the organizational culture? Uh, how can we talk about adopting these tools as part of the day-to-day -day processes? So uh, that is going to be the next frontier for Mars Snacking. And I think uh, uh, we, along with your partnership, we will be prepared uh, future-proofing our Mars Snacking business. First, thanks for sharing the story of the Honduran Bridge and sort of the different iterations or lives that it served. Uh, I think that's such a great analogy. And I'll say to your last point on Mars snacking, the longer I've been in this business of, of sort of the tooling around data and analytics, the more I believe exactly what you just said, which is it's less about the tools and more about the cultural transformation um, for the organization to get excited about the vision of what um, what this can, what data and analytics can do. I truly understand your consumers better, your your fellow employees better, and you're really your opportunity in the world. So I love that you're embracing um, both pieces um, of of the transformation. Absolutely. And, and Shelly, I think uh, this is important uh, for the industry in general as well. I think. Uh, uh, in the beginning, we used to spend a lot of time uh, building capabilities uh, to, uh, to drive with a lot of speed. Then we started building solutions that can scale. Then uh, subsequently, we went to uh, sustainable solutions. I think uh, one thing that we, if we can continue to emphasize, and for every uh, dollar that we spend on tools, if we can spend the same uh, dollar on driving cultural transformation and change management, I think we will win as an organization. We will uh, be able to influence that data-driven decision-making. I think that that's what we are seeing at Mars. It's a, gosh, you know, I never thought about it that way, but you're right. And it, if there was a way to actually measure uh, sort of the cultural transformation aspect or the adoption um, of, of, of the tooling to change the cultural understanding, um, that would be <laughs> really um, a, a transformational uh, for organizations because you're right, the scale, the sustainability, they're only ultimately measured by the rate at which the organizations really adopt and understand the tooling. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So uh, you've given us a lot to think about, and I, you know, I just want to say, um, you know, thinking about even the the three principles of early in your career and um, small things with great love from Mother Teresa. It's uh, you and I are doing this recording on Valentine's Day, um, which is why I'm wearing my red, um, and I think it's just um, such a wonderful way and reminder of the principles we need to take with us um, in our careers. I'm going to I'm going to finish things off in this season 3 of Taking Stock Live. I, you get to be the the subject where I ask these sort of fun five random questions just so that the audience can get to know you Deepak a little bit more as a person. So are you are you ready for me to fire some questions at you? Oh, absolutely, Shelley. Go for it. Okay, good. <laughs> We've learned some interesting things. So first off, what is the weirdest thing you have ever eaten? Yes, uh weirdest thing, I think uh my friends once tricked me into eating a meat which tasted pretty much like chicken, but it was a snake. So <laughs> that was the most weirdest thing. And that, that was the first and last thing I, I ever tried. It. I wouldn't recommend it for my best friends or enemies either. <laughs> well, those friends, we got to we gotta investigate what kind of friends those are. And I, uh, later, I'd love to hear how they actually tricked you into eating snake and everything tastes like chicken, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That's true. 
<laughs> wow. Okay. Who's your favorite superhero? Favorite superhero? Um, I have uh, watched Dark Knight, the Batman series, probably more than 15 times. So I, I should go for Batman. But uh, I mean, I generally, uh, th that's Batman is my answer. But uh, again, my real life superhero is my mom. She is uh -huh. a real inspiration for me. And uh, uh, and I'm, I am I'll owe a lot to her for making me who I am and giving me the constant source of motivation. That's that's the best answer I've gotten on this. And um, wow, she must be so incredibly proud of you. And to, to be on the same uh, level with uh, with Batman um, is pretty impressive <laughs> in and of itself. <laughs> Very good. How about the best invention ever? Best invention, um, I would say printing press. press. Uh, in, uh, I mean, 1450 uh, or so by Gutenberg. And I think uh, I, I think it kind of helped us spread the idea of literacy around the world. I think that was one of the biggest invention which resulted in changing, uh, connecting humans, uh, retaining knowledge and uh, driving literacy across the world, right? Like influencing billions of people. So I think uh, I, I would vote printing press as one and the the close second is internet but let me stay with printing press for now <laughs> i love the i love that you went back to the printing press and i couldn't agree more what a sort of democratization of of, of information and knowledge so we'll, we'll stay there versus the internet for now <laughs> and how about um if you could be a fly on the wall who you know any conversation who would you want to listen to and why I think it's a it's a uh, tough question. I think the toughest question <laughs> today. I think uh, because I have multiple people I would love to listen to. I think Nelson Mandela is one. Uh, uh, Martin Luther King uh, is another one, and probably Abraham Lincoln. I have a lot of respect uh, and uh, admiration to leaders who were able to challenge the status quo with a lot of courage and they who truly change the world. So if I get a chance, I would listen to all three of them. But uh, again, Abraham Lincoln would be uh, the one answer. Wow. Well, um, the incredible answers. And I can see why it would be hard to choose among the three. OK, so dream job and why? This is your last question. Dream job. Um, uh, Shelly, have you heard about this Japanese concept called Ikigai? No, I haven't. Oh. So, uh, so this Jan Japanese concept of Ikigai says, I think your dream job should be uh, what you love, what the world needs, what you are good at, and what you can get paid for. The intersection of all these should be anyone's G dream job. So that is the concept of Ikigai. For me, I believe in the power of technology uh, to solve the world's biggest problems, not only for uh, the people, it for the planet, and eventually driving profit. Now, I am currently doing a job which uh, sits as my ikigai, leveraging the power of technology to solve the problems uh, for Mars, a big organization, by keeping purpose in the heart of whatever decisions that we take. So I would love to continue to do a similar kind of a job. I think uh, that's what I would call my dream job. How can I leverage and change the status quo uh, leveraging technology? Such a great answer. Thank you for educating me and the audience around Ikigai. Did I pronounce that right? You can <laughs> correct me. <laughs> you go for it. Ikigai is what, how I call it, so go for it. Ikigai. Yes. Fantastic. Yeah. And I think, you know, um, even just looking forward to this interview, Deepak, um, the purpose um, that you're bringing and the, and the leaders that you referenced to this role, it's an inspiration for all of us, to your point of solving the, the most critical challenges of people, planet and, and purpose and profits along the way. So um, thank you for sharing that with us. I think I'll uh, leave you with a, a closing story as well. Uh, and Please. This is, uh, this is uh, uh, something which my mentor told me, which uh, uh, stuck with me all the while. Uh, so let me ask you this question. Do you know how do lions hunt gazelles? How do lions hunt gazelles? I, I have no idea. Yeah, so 
So uh, gazelles run, run twice as fast as land. They much, they are they move really fast. They are really agile. So uh, in the pride of land, the young lions chase the gazelles. The older lions would be waiting, uh, and uh, when the gazelles are really close, the older lion would just jump and roar, right? And the gazelles won't be able to move out of fear. I mean, it's like a deer in front of a headlight and the lions would have them for their lunch. No, but do you know how do these gazelles escape? The, yeah. the, the gazelles, those who escape, they continue to run towards the lion and they can simply jump through them. Now, I heard this story and he told this about the, the new generation data scientists and how they are facing, what are the challenges that they are facing in large organizations. See, uh, sometimes uh, a gazelle can be quite equivalent to a data and analytics professional who brings in the new technology, who are fast, who are agile. But there is a, a old line within the large organization that we work with. That is the orthodoxy, the gut-based decision mindset. And if you want to truly uh, escape out of it, you need to be agile and you need to have the courage to jump through them. So if there is one uh, uh, topic or theme that I want to leave all of uh, you with is like uh, for driving digital transformation to drive driving technology transformation, the biggest factor is your ability to challenge the status quo. And courage is the first and first thing that you should uh, embrace and you should uh, challenge the status quo to make transformational changes. Wow. <laughs> That's quite a quite a close, Deepak. And is that the reason why you have that beautiful photo of a lion behind yes, you? Yes. So I, I generally get this question, is that for, uh, is that to showcase, is that to scare people? No, I think it is to always a reminder that if you want to challenge the status quo, you need to have the courage. Well, I will tell you that as a child, um, one of my favorite plays, movies was The Wizard of Oz and the, and the lion who had needed to uh, have courage. Uh, so what an incredible uh, model and story for you to share with all of us. Thanks, really. Yeah, thank you so much. Great conversation. I feel like we could have talked for hours now. I want to know more about your mother, too, by the way. But huge thanks for coming. Thanks for all of you for joining us on yet another edition of Taking Stock Live. It was a great conversation. I can't wait to see your questions and your feedback. Please post them up. And we'll see you again in our next wonderful conversation. Take care, everybody. 